Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Tigra India talk series. Uh, we are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lobna Hassan, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies at Tampa University, Finland. Uh, she holds a PhD in economics and business administration from Hankin School of Economics, uh, Finland. Dr. Hassan conducts research pertaining to game accessibility, gamification, virtual reality, storification, and e-participation. She has published in reputable journals, including user modeling and user adapted interaction, International Journal of Information Management and Information and Software Technology. On behalf of the Degra India Committee, I would like to welcome Dr. Hassan to our platform. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And I'm really very happy to be here. I was just talking before the talk that I wish that one day I would visit India, hopefully soon now that the pandemic is maybe uh, getting under control. So I'm, I'm really happy to be visiting virtually, at least in the meanwhile. And uh, Jeffrey, we, do we start or wait? Uh, I just have to let uh, share a few rules and regulations with the audience, and then I will hand it over. Uh, so yes, so before we can get started, a few points to keep in mind. First, that this talk is being recorded. And as such, we would kindly request the audience to keep themselves on mute. And we will be taking questions at the end of the session, but not in between. So please uh, keep that in mind. And uh, you can also perhaps write your questions in the chat box. Also, any queries, uh, and we will respond to you over in the chat. Also, we strive to uh, keep this community as an inclusive one. So we kindly request members to be mindful of our rules and guidelines in any communication that occurs in this meeting. So, well, without any further ado, uh, here's to having an exciting and fruitful session. Dr. Hassan, over to you. All right, thank you, sounds great. Okay, I tried to time this talk around 40 minutes, but uh, we will see what happens so that we have 20 minutes after for questions and it doesn't last too long, but uh, I am very happy to stay for as long as uh, we would want. So yeah, this is now my slide is being shared. Uh, Jeffrey really did such an amazing introduction of me. So uh, there isn't much more that I would like to say. Uh, these are my contacts. If the, here, the, this is my email. If you would like to shoot me any questions or uh, contact me in any way after the talk, and this is my website if you want to have a, a look on my publication. Um, so, yeah, uh, what we're going to do today is start by generally talking about why is accessibility important as an idea, and then move slowly towards why game accessibility specifically how do we implement it, some examples of things that are good and things that are bad, and some findings from our research with uh, people with disabilities. So uh, quickly, I'm gonna check how can I, um, if you would use the chat, can I open my chat? Yes. Okay, so quickly just by showing maybe Y for yes and N for no, how many of you listen to audiobooks? So if you listen to audiobooks in any way, press Y or yes or anything. <laughs> if you don't, yep, answers are coming. Okay. All right. It seems we have a 50-50 division at the moment, more than 50. Okay. I do listen to, yep. All right, so it seems that a good number listens to audiobook. Not everyone, one of course, because yeah, but a good number of people. And these are statistics that I found online. I kind of feel that they are a bit exaggerated, like saying that 75% of adults in the UK listen to audiobooks. Like that, that sounds a bit exaggerated, but the reality is that a lot of people listen to audiobooks not as just the only means of reading a book, but while washing dishes, while exercising, I think you're all um, familiar with that. Next one, quickly. Um, if Which one here would you choose? If you would choose the electric escalator, press one. If you will choose the stairs, press two <laughs> or type two. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes this doesn't work um, if I am talking to people who are very athletic and it seems that here, Yes, it, you, are, you are such athletic people, I guess. 
Um, but this was from an ad that tries to encourage people to take this, the, the stairs, the regular stairs, so that they become healthier rather than taking the scouter. Um, so it seems that in general, most people would go for the electric one, um, except you guys, because <laughs> you people are very um, athletic, it, it thinks. Um, to if in a hurry, otherwise, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. If you're in a hurry, then just skip wherever people are more crowded, I, I would say. Okay, last one, <laughs> subtitles. Um, if you use subtitles for any reason, why, uh, press Y or enter, type Y. If you don't, then type N, okay. That is like 100% <laughs> use. Okay, um, nice. 100% of people use subtitles. Um, this is actually me trying to learn Finnish because it's such a hard language. So this is me watching Frozen and having the subtitles on in Finnish. Um, and uh, I, I still can't learn it, but that's another issue. Uh, and the subtitles started in movies and in, in uh, media that is shown in cinema and in, on TV as a way of especially integrating people with hearing disabilities who cannot see what is happening on the screen. And sometimes the subtitles in, in some cases would describe that, um, uh, sorry, people who cannot um, hear the text um, so sometimes the, the, the subtitles would describe the tone of the speaker. So the, he says angrily, uh, I'm leaving, for example. Um, so not just describing the words, but even the intonation that accompany it so that um, any, everyone can follow the media. And subtitles is kind of the, the first thing of this accessibility stuff that started moving into video games very early on. This is from The Witcher. And it's kind of the same thing. Um, it's not just used here as subtitles, but also as mean for interaction with the game. So the game here is asking you to make a choice and you indicate the choice um, by pressing one or two. So that is kind of was the easiest thing to appear in games because of this interaction that, that happens, which was facilitated through text-based games um, and text-based selection as a start. But all of these features that we've been talking about, subtitles, audiobooks, skeletors, they were popularized because of disabilities and they flourished more through accessibility research and research that works on integrating people with different abilities in society. So not just people who are disabled, but as we will see later, for example, someone carrying something heavy. For them, the electric escalator would be nice. Um, someone trying to le learn a different language or doesn't ha have time. Um, these have benefits for everyone, although they have originated from uh, disabilities and accessibility research. And eventually we started to call this the curb cut effect. And we call it the curb cut effect because when we started noticing this, when we started noticing that things for disabled people help everyone was around the Second World War um, yeah, the Second World War, when afterwards European cities and other cities also in Asia um, were rebuilding themselves and thinking about how do we build modern cities. And one of the things they ran into, well, wheelchair users. So we need to make these curb cuts, cuts in the curb or cuts in the pavement to help anyone access the city as equally as everyone else. And you would think that these are easy to implement, um, but these curb cuts are basically rocket science. Like this is how much math and engineering goes into making this small slit in, in the pavement. It is, it is not easy. And at that time when resources were scarce, engineers were, were scarce and governments are thinking very closely about where they put their money. There was a lot of talk about like, is this, useful use of public resources that we spend, I don't know how much, thousands on making these. Um, and lucky for us, they were implemented and they were increasingly implemented more and more. And then we started to observe all what we have been talking about, which that these curb cuts are not just used by wheelchair users, but this is like you would assume an able man um, and he's just using it probably because this is what he's pulling behind him is heavy. And we see this with um, anyone who's pushing a stroller, for example, 
anyone who's just like lazy in a way, like just doesn't want to make the climb because like any, for any reason. Um, and so this was the first documentation of the curb cut effect. And it says that if we invest in accessibility, these investments are going to um, just be investments in the well-being of society as a whole. Uh, and thank you, Ishan, for <laughs> seeing me. I, I would also use the, or I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but yeah, I would also use the curb cuts uh, just because it's easier, I think, if, if that's what you meant. Um, so this is why accessibility matters in society. It, it not only benefits this group of people with disabilities, but everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ishan. Um, this is because accessible designs are the most usable designs. They are designed to be used with the least effort possible because you're, you're designing them for someone, for example, who can't hear. So you're trying to bypass this barrier to participation by being as simple as possible without needing hearing, or you're designing them to climb the step with the least effort possible so that someone on a wheelchair can, can, can climb it. Um, so this is sort of a, univer a universal um, observation that accessible designs are the most usable, they are the easiest, and so they are beneficial to everyone. But if we focus more on uh, disabilities and um, just quickly look at how many people uh, like directly need accessibility in order to, to participate, then we will notice that there are around 1 billion people in the world living with, disability, with a disability. This statistic is, is from the United Nation. It's from 2011, but it remains the most updated for some reason. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not sure why, but one, one billion, that is a huge number of people. Like it's a huge market. If we think about it as business, it's a huge number of people in terms of humanity. It, it's, it's a significant. And, uh, this number is also increasing because of a lot of reason, reasons, including that the population is aging naturally. And on the other side, medical advances are there to keep people alive longer, um, and, and so the, the, with, the, with aging, we have more population getting into, uh, for example, hearing challenges or vision challenges, mobility and, and so on. And outside of aging, we have people naturally born with any kind of a disability for any reason. We have, unfortunately, wars, natural disasters. So it's, it's this number is, um, it's there, it's present. It's not something as I will talk about later, that we can medicate or fix or eliminate with medical advances or something. It's actually um, increasing because of medical advances, which, which I would say is a good thing, but um, uh, let, let's not get into this argument. Um, within games specifically, we know that there are approximately 2.5 to 3 billion gamers in the world. So this is approximately half the world's population plays games. And uh, this, of course, depends on how you define gamer. I, I, in, in here, we're defining a gamer as someone who plays a game, um, like just even plays Candy Crush or something, like a light, even a uh, player of games, not necessarily just heavy users. And it's important to note that this is also, this number excludes people who use serious games, for example, like school children, who might not have access to games, uh, might not have a console at home or, or a mobile phone or, or something, but they play a serious game in their classroom. Um, and other people who, for whatever moral, moral reason or for whatever reason, they don't play games, but they use like an exercise app to track their fitness and, and that app is gamified. So the number of people who interact with anything game related or game inspired, I would say is huge. It's probably more than half the world population, but even like half is is a lot. And of those people, at least a third experience a disability that affects their playing of games or use of these applications. And the key thing here to know is that this third is also a conservative estimate because disability is something that is connected with a lot of stigma and people do not always want to share this information about their um, abilities. Like they, it's, um, it's, it's not 
information that is easy to, to get. So I would also say that one third is maybe a conservative estimate. So again, this is a large number of people um, who are affected or, or a, a reference for this slide. I actually have many references for, for this slide, but there I can maybe if we take a break or something, I can do that. Um, but I think that at least the third is from the European Blind Union. I think, if I'm if I'm correct, I will provide the reference. <laughs> um, should have put them there. But yeah, and uh, so why game accessibility? So I usually would think that we want equality in this world, like we want everyone to be happy and to have access to the same opportunities. Um, and I will use this argument in a second. Um, but, you know, it's it's the, the, in this world, money is kind of important. So this is why it's also like, I also try to highlight that aside from the humanity aspect, which for me is, is key, um, we are talking about a big market in games that is not tapped into and that is not um, designed for yet as much as possible. And we are not only thinking, like when we're thinking about designing accessible games, yes, we're thinking about people with disabilities who are maybe blind or deaf or using wheelchairs, but there is an idea of situational disability. Like, for example, if I have a kid, for example, like a baby, and I want to play a game, and I don't want to put a head, headphones on because I want to be able to listen to the baby if it cries, um, but the game requires audio for whatever reason. So this is a problem in, because in practice, in this situation, it is as if I am deaf because I can't listen to the audio that the game is providing because the baby would wake up and I can't put he headphones because I want to listen to the baby. So for example, if I break my hand or something and then I can't really um, use a controller with both hands because then my one hand is broken. So there is also the idea of situational disability that because of whatever reason you do not have or me would not have the ideal gamer body and that affects our ability to use the game and hence in, in situations like this also um, game accessibility would be nice to have. And so if we have accessible games, then these are games that are easy to use to everyone, uh, even in these situations, and then they will be more widely enjoyed and probably more played and, and more uh, income will come from them, which is good for game companies, at least um, business-wise. There is also the idea that a few years ago, we were saying that the average age of a gamer was 30 years old. And um, at least the Finnish parameter, which is a, a study that is has been done annually to see how many people in Finland play games and at what ages. Um, in 2008, it was saying that the average age of a gamer in Finland is 30. The latest study that came out just this year in 2021 um, says that the average age of a gamer is 38. And we can say attribute this to many things like the pandemic has made more older people play. Um, games are becoming more important, so also older people are playing. But there is also the fact that the gaming population is aging. Like people like me or older and younger who were born with games in their homes, like the millennials basically and Gen Z, um, these people are aging and as they age, they are going to develop accessibility issues and, and uh, disabilities. So if this is not a need for the mass gaming market today, it is going to become a need very, very soon. And then lastly, there is the last idea that we can use games to provide access to life experiences that otherwise people cannot access. For example, I have low vision, so I cannot drive because if I drive, this is bad for me and bad for people. And so I have this, it's like just a gaming wheel. And this is the closest I will get to driving a car. And this is a life experience that I cannot have otherwise. So this in itself is a value and it extends to, for example, travel. Like um, so many people tell me, oh, I have seen the pyramids in Assassin's Creed and <laughs> they feel like to the extent they have visited Egypt or they have visited different 
locations through the games. So there is the tourism aspect. So if we have games that are easy to use, think about um, older people or, or even younger people that we can educate them about the world using these uh, kind of experiences. So it is to the benefit of people. And then specifically, it is a matter of equal access. And if the slides turn, yes, basic human rights and equality of uh, basic rights. And maybe like a few years ago, we would say that games were just a nerd activity that a few people play and it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, nowadays it is not, it, th that it's a cultural phenomenon, that, that is not the case. And especially with games becoming like means of education, means of socialization, connecting with others, if games are inaccessible, then these experiences by extension are not accessible um, to people. And in the chat, the game must be realistic to provide. Yeah, the, and that is an issue in itself. Like the, if we want these experiences, then games should be realistic. Um, and to what extent do we want the games to be realistic? Like, yes, that is um, true um, of if we want to use games that way. And so like generally, the more that games become integral in our society, the more that we need to ensure that no people are left behind because they are not just left behind of entertainment and maybe they can consume entertainment in different ways. No, they are left behind of education, of popular culture, um, of a lot of things. One last point, um, which is that empowering, especially people with disabilities benefit everyone in the sense that these people have skills different from the mass skills. And to explain this, I'm going to use an example. This is from the Guardian, um, from the UK, one of the UK surveillance agency. And uh, th this is, I'm not in support of or against surveillance. This is not the point. <laughs> but the point is that this is an organization that deals with sensitive matters. Y you know, like they would want to get the best. Well, any organization wants to get the best. But um, in, in this situation, you would think that they want to really like select people with, with good abilities um, to make sure that the country is safe and so on. And this was a news that came out recently, if I remember the date in 2021, yes, here it is, that says that they specifically like to hire people with dyslexia because their brain works differently. They see patterns in a different way, different from people without dyslexia. And that is true in all, all almost kind of disabilities, whether they are um, cognitive, uh, visual, uh, hearing, and, and so on. Like even simple, like um, Daredevil, for example, is a superhero who is blind, but, but uh, uses his ears to fight uh, crime. And regardless that this is insane and cannot happen in real life, there is this perception that people who are blind, for example, have very good hearing. Um, so like, this is like a mainstream example of that, uh, math, math, yeah, <laughs> this is a mainstream example of that. People with disabilities would benefit society if we empower them and give them the tools and, um, the, the places where they can, where we can see the benefits of their, these abilities in, uh, um, like shine. I'm trying to choose my words very carefully because it's a sensitive topic. Um, but yeah. So um, generally, these are, I would say, the reasons why accessibility is important. And I hope that you are convinced at this stage of why we want to have accessible games. Um, and usually at this stage, I would like to move on to discussing, like, I hope I've convinced you. Um, so now how do we actually do it? Like, how do we make accessible games? And the first sort of wave of games for people with disabilities this, that started said like, okay, let's sit with people with disabilities, like the blind, the deaf, the so on, and see what do they want? What are their abilities and design games for them? And an example of that is audio games. So audio games using a blind legend as an example, a Blind Legend is on Steam and it was celebrated a few years ago as one of the first audio games on Steam that can be played fully blind. You don't need to see anything. There is no graphical interface. And it's um, like, if you have never played an audio game, I would encourage just knowing the experience of it because it's different from regular games. 
And basically what you do is you put on your headphones and you try to listen to the audio. So you start the game, there is a guide telling you move forward and you move forward with your keyboard. Uh, and then someone comes and tries to fight you. So you try to listen from which direction is that some, a person coming and move to fight in that direction. So it's, it's like implementing the regular fight game mechanics, but in just pure audio base. And it is um, like an interesting experience. There are other audio games that are about storytelling. So it's not necessarily fighting someone. Um, but the whole, like the, the idea overall is that Yes, this is a nice um, idea that we have games for people with disabilities. Thank you for doing it. But what this effectively does is it's as if you're telling people with disabilities, hey, um, take this toy and go sit in a corner and, and play with it by yourself, which doesn't help really in the social part and doesn't really help overall because people with disabilities want to play the same things as everyone else. They want to be a part of the conversation. Um, they want to know what is this Assassin's Creed that everyone's talking about. Um, like, you know, like when Game of Thrones, for example, was a thing, some people didn't like Game of Thrones, but they wanted to know at least the highlights so that when their colleagues and friends talk about it, they know what is happening. It's, it's just part of being aware of popular culture. So games designed especially for disabilities are nice but they are not the end of the story and here um i i hope i can share these slides because i have a few links um but we'll, we'll we can discuss this um i can also put them in in chat at the end um this is like this is a video um, about someone who is fully blind and he plays mortal kombat and mortal kombat is especially known for, for their accessibility. And they are especially popular in the blind community. Yes, Xbox, adapt, yes, adaptive controller. That's a big part of it. <laughs> it, it works with Mortal Kombat a lot. And um, so if you listen to the video, the person plays this Mortal Kombat, which is a, like a mainstream game in the same way that he plays an audio, an audio game. He knows um, that he, for example, is gonna start the game I'm not sure on which side. I think this side, or, or maybe the other one. I'm not sure, but like, like he knows which start, which side he starts on. He spends some time learning um, the controls and memorizing what does what, and then he just puts on his headphones and he knows what is happening and how to move just using the audio, and he like beats people who are sighted <laughs> playing against him. Um, this is what people with disabilities want to do. They want to play mainstream games with their friends, they just want to have the tools to do that. And this is not an isolated case. So um, in around 2018, I think, I did like an informal survey um, of people in my community and I asked them what games or um, gamified apps do you use? And this was not really a proper study at that stage, but it was a start of me going into accessibility research. And these were some of their answers which these were mostly people with visual impairment, so low vision or um, fully blind on somewhere on that spectrum. And they are playing, I would say, regular games that the, the titles are popular with everyone, I, I would say. And then very recently, this year, actually, in 2012, I'm sorry, in 2022, we started a systematic survey of people with disabilities. Um, and we try to reach as many people as, as possible from different categories as possible. This was a survey led by Paulina Baltazar and Marcos Kamarainen. If you um, would later on want to look up their names, they are uh, students at Tampere University. I'm very lucky to work with and they are very uh, talented. And we had 95 responses to the survey, which is um, like within disability research, it is very hard to find survey respondents. Um, for example, one of the reasons is that people discount their own disability. And we see this a lot with the psychopsychiatric, or sorry, the neuropsychiatric disabilities. So for example, ADHD, depression, anxiety, um, even within the like researchers, there is discussion on whether these disabilities should be considered a disability or not. And so you have people 
or like, yeah, I see a little bit. It's it's not like I'm fully blind. No, I, I'm not disabled. Or they are, they have a, like a low vision or something, but the term disability for them is not comfortable to use. Or they have a, a neuropsychiatric condition and they do not consider it as a disability. So there is a pop-up. Um, and uh, I'm... I think someone requesting control of my screen, so I'm going to decline it. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is part of, oh, depression was considered. Yeah, well, so in our case, we, um, Jeffrey, there are people who want control of my screen. Why is this happening? <laughs> uh, it's just, just ignore that. I'll just be okay. looking at it. No, that's okay. I'm just I'm making sure that it's not you or or someone like in in your team. But okay, um, yeah, we we had a, a long discussion about depression and and anxiety and and ADHD, like this category. We didn't know if to include them or not. We ended up including them under under this category, and then um, because there we also added a special question, and you're you're gonna see. Is it the next one? Um, we can we can go to it. So does your disability affect your playing? So that that was our criteria for us. Like if you have ADHD and for example, having a screen with too much information feels distracting for you and you don't know what to do and so you give up on this game because of that, then it, we, we thought that in this case, we will consider it because it has an impact. Um, but it is a huge debate on whether it should, uh, be considered or not. I'm just was reading the chat. Um, so yeah, we we did that, but it is uh, you know uh, so subject to debate. All right, let me go back. Oops. To okay. <laughs> uh, yes, here. All right. So this data, it was mostly qualitative questions. So we're still in the phase of data analysis uh, because we're coding everything and 95 answers. We were lucky that we got a few that were writing paragraphs and, and pages of answers. So, so that was um, good for us. Um, but yeah, so next is that we asked them how often do they play digital games? And so we see that they have been playing games for a very long time. So most of the people have been games have been playing games for 20 years. Um, so they are like from millennials, I would say, or like they, are, they grew up with games. And also we have people in the category of 11 to 20. So like most people with disabilities have been playing games for a while and they play if we look here, I would say an average of an hour per week. Like we have a lot of people in the less than six, six hours per week and in six to 10. So that, that would be an average of like an hour per day. Sorry, um, I would say. Uh, and uh, if you want, go for this. <laughs> yes, go. I heard the game control is very hard to play, but I haven't, I haven't tried it, but um, anyway. <laughs> uh, and one of the reasons we got the answer when we were still coding in the coding stage, one of the reasons we got this answer of that people tend to play like an average of an hour a day is that they tend to use games mostly for relaxation. So we got a lot of people saying in text that they play the game at the end of the day to relax. And we have observed that many of the reasons they mentioned for playing games are the reasons that anyone else without a disability would say they are using the games for. Um, so we didn't have a lot of people saying special things like for rehabilitation, um, to improve my motor skills, for example. No, they were just playing games because they are fun. They, they, they want to relax, they want to uh, connect with friends, and th that's the main reason for, for why um, they are playing games. We also asked them about, do you use accessibility feature? And most of them said yes. Um, some people said, mentioned later on in text that they do not necessarily use the accessibility features in games, um, but they might have their own assistive technology on their computer. So have a screen reader, for example, that reads some of the uh, game text for them or an extra magnifying glass that they use to look at the screen. 
Um, we also had a lot of people, especially in the no category, saying that, well, I don't know if the game has accessibility feature. And, and this is was a huge problem, especially when they come to buy games. So we had a few people saying that um, it would be nice if Steam, for example, had something that indicates what accessibility options are in the game, if any, beforehand. Because like something like The Last of Us, when it was being released, it was advertised for its accessibility. Like that was part of the PR of it. With other games, especially by indie developers, they might have something like, for example, simply the ability to enlarge font, for example, or uh, have subtitles and, and nothing in the game is, is communicated just in audio. Um, but players would not know about these smaller features until they actually buy the game. So if, if there was something in Steam that indicates that to them, that would be nice, then they would know, and then they would buy games that have accessibility features directly. Um, rather than just buy a game and try to figure it out themselves how to play it. Um, but but also this is like um, promising for accessibility researchers that well a lot of people use the, the, the features that we are working on and also for companies. So the effort that they would put in making these accessibility features, um, it is likely that if it is known that these features are there that uh, players with disabilities are going to use them. But we also noticed some tension in the sense that uh, going going back again to this figure on the right, that almost like the majority, most of people with disabilities said that their disability affects them. Um, but then they do not use or did not say, yes, they use disability features. And we noticed something else other than whether they know about the features or not. Um, we've noticed something like self-blame in the sense that, well, the game is okay, like the phones are fine, the audio is fine, it's just me who has a disability and so the game doesn't work for me. Um, we, we have seen writings like this in a few answers, actually like slightly less than half, but like we've, we've saw it a lot that people are blaming themselves and claiming their disability, they are the problem, um, rather than demanding or saying that, had the game been better, I would have played it more. And we especially see it in, I'm going to jump ahead, in statements like this. Um, so here are two interesting statements. What do you think of the statement that game accessibility or that games are accessible for me? Um, so most people, they are in this area where they agree that most games are accessible to them. However, when you compare it also to this question, we asked them, would you play more if games are more accessible? And they say, yes, we would play more. So how is it that you would play more if the game is already accessible to you? Um, so this was like noticing this was our first clue that there is something more. And then when we looked into the um, long text answers, we were lucky to see that. Um, that, that, that the self play, like, yeah, I wish I would play more. I wish games are better, um, but also games are fine as is. It's the problem is not with games. The problem is, is with me, kind of, um, which is interesting to observe in the data. I'm, I'm, I'm just um, mentioning it, but um, we still need to probably dig more into that. Um, and then going back to the questions, we asked uh, people, do they play single player or multiplayer? And it seems that they play both um, single player, maybe more because they mentioned about relaxing. And I would guess that multiplayer games are more stressful. Um, this is me assuming, I don't know. <laughs> um, and also there are more accessibility issues with multiplayer games than there are with single player. Like with single player, you can manage your setup the way you want them. Um, but when it's multiplayer, you are affecting other people. And, and so it's harder to have the setup that you want or to play at the level that you want without annoying others, for example. Multiplayer is, yes, I would agree, way, way more stressful. And then we asked them again about what games they play now um, in, in a formal survey. Uh, and these were the answers. So these are mainstream games. Um, 
we ask them what, what is like what yeah um what what game do you play or what is your favorite game if i remember correctly what is your favorite game and and these were um the popular mentions that were there so mainstream games we haven't noticed um like games that we did not recognize and i'm not sure if they did that like if if the respondents intentionally used examples that we would recognize as the as their favorite game um, or if they are actually, this is the games that they're playing and they're not gravitating to audio games or to games that are especially for people with disabilities. Um, we're, we're not sure about that. And I am <laughs> happy to hear about the magic circle talk. <laughs> and uh, um, how do they play? So these were some, th these are not photos from the survey. These are photos online from the web. Um, and, and these are some examples of the way that people play. Like um, some people just get very close to the screen. This is an example of visual um, impairment. Screen zoom applications where uh, it just enlarges everything on your screen, including the icons and, and the game layout itself. A lot of people, um, myself included, play on Macs because Macs have screen readers and have superior Zoom options. And that is an issue because, as you probably know, most games do not run on Mac or like at least most good games <laughs> do not run on Mac. Um, Braille keyboards are popular, um, but the most users of Braille keyboards would also be playing audio games mostly. Um, and this is also like a screen reader or sorry, a screen Zoom um, example. Then there is the adaptive controller, of course, was mentioned a lot. Uh, and I really like this random photo from the web because this is the effect that accessibility can have. Like, see how many generations are in this photo. And then also, like, how many different abilities. And, and, and this is why I like that. I really love this image in the sense that this is the goal. Like, we want to bring different generations together through games that they are all can enjoy and have a conversation, for example, while they are playing. In our survey, we did not see people playing VR games. Um, I need to check again if we forgot to ask about it or if, if like why it was not mentioned. Um, but also most VR adaptation to accessibility is still very early. Um, and we have generally fidelity issues in, in the sense that generally graphics are still not that great in VR. And so if you try to render things in good fonts with good contrast with the level of technology now, it is doable, um, but then it becomes very expensive or at least it, it needs good gear and expensive games and so on. So I think VR going into mainstream and going into like the disability market is still in the research phase. Um, but please correct me Correct me if, I, if I'm wrong because um, we at least didn't get a lot of answers about this. And uh, just checking the time, okay. We also saw people talking about a leveled playing field when they are playing accessible games. So they would mention things like, uh, I feel challenges all my life. Like if I want to go out with my wheelchair, uh, the roads are not paved. Um, if I want to read a book, I can't really find it on audiobook. They mention all of these challenges, but they say that when I play an accessible game, I suddenly feel equal to other people. I can beat them. I can uh, compete. And when they especially beat someone, <laughs> like someone with a disability be beats someone without a disability, it's like this euphoric moment of finally I can be... Um, I can win something in life. And so it's like it's it seems that the feelings they have in games transcend just that this is fun and enjoyment in games. It is it is um like a, a life experience um it, it, for them. So it's I I would say for me personally, it's beautiful to to read that. Uh and I'm had here a few examples of how to make games accessible. I'll try not to spend a lot of time on them. Um, but so a few examples of of good things and bad things and and some general guidelines uh based on like well the general the guidelines are established but also some observations based on the survey data that we have thus far so um there are in life when we discuss disabilities two way two ways to to talk about disability generally there is the medical model which used to be very popular um in the 70s 80s 90s and still exists, but it's getting less popular, hopefully, which is that disability is a problem. 
and we need to fix it. So go get a wheelchair, go get glasses, a hearing aid, fix your problem kind of a situation. And that has attributed to disability being seen as a bad thing and something that we want to eradicate and something that is not worth spending on because we should just fix it and remove it from the world. And this view, like it had had some benefits in helping advance the medical technology in, in like us discovering wheelchairs and glasses and, you know, throughout history, like, yeah, it, it had its benefit in helping improve things. However, I want to mention here, like the, the story by H.J. Wells called The Country of the Blind, um, which there, there are many excerpts of it on, online, like short summaries, that it's a story of uh, a town where everyone there was born blind. And then for some reason, this one kid is born and that kid sees, he, he has vision. And so everyone look at him at like, what is wrong with you? How, how, what are these things that you're talking about that we do not know of? Because none of them was seeing beforehand. And the point of this story and others, there are so many examples like this, and they started to change our view of disability is that anything different than the mainstream, different than the ideal bo gamer of, uh, body of the gamer, um, ideal ability, anything we can consider disability. And if we change our perspective, we can also consider it differently. And so that was the start of the social model, which says that it is society who determines or what determines what is an, a, a disability or not. So in, in the country of the blind, seeing was weird. It was a, it was a disability, um, unlike in our society where being blind is the disability. Um, and so if we change our perspective as a society and stop thinking of disabilities as disabilities, but redesign our things. So redesign our streets, have curb cuts, have uh, accessible games, accessible technologies, then people would not even experience disability. Like think about it, someone using a wheelchair and from the moment they leave their house until they go to school or work, everything is smooth for them and accessible. After a while, they would not notice even that there is a challenge or that there is something different or a disability about them. But because our streets are designed this way, we experience disability and we feel that there is something that needs um, to be fixed. And so the social model of disability is what is driving accessibility nowadays and what is driving change in design. And um, whether you want to call it accessible design, universal design, inclusive, whatever game you want, uh, sorry, name you want to give to it, the idea is that we want to design an environment that is, can be used to the greatest extent possible by everyone. So with the least effort can be used by every, because if you make an investment in, in your town, for example, you build a building and for some reason that building is only used by 10% of people, then that is a waste of resources. <laughs> but um, so if universally designed, used by everyone, then that is a benefit to everyone. A most simple example is doors where you do not even know if you should pull or push. And so you can think of this like a disability, like a challenge, like you don't understand what is going on. There is something stopping you from doing the thing that you want. And, and I can, we can tell ourselves like, go fix yourself. What is wrong with you? Put on glasses or do something. Or we can design things differently. Like if you come to this door, for example, and you don't even see the word push, like imagine it's not, it's not even there. Um, intuitively, you would understood that, okay, like I just, there is no other way to open the door by, by just pushing. And so just redesigning things so that they are more intuitive, they are used with least effort. That is what accessibility is about and what the social model um, universal design, all, all of these terms are um, trying to say. And the way to do that in games is to understand like that we need multimodality in communication. So do not communicate information in just text, just audio, just colors. Use different ways of communicating information and give, and give people autonomy, give them options. Um, starting from like remapping options to, to options in everything, um, options in colors and games, option in do I want to play with uh, text, uh, with subtitles on and off, with audio on and off, 
giving people options uh, and then they are going to figure out for themselves what what works from for themselves so um which her successful but i mean like they had a huge area here to enlarge this text um so th that is annoying <laughs> in 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 it and and it's simple to fix like enlarging texts or giving the option that the text can be enlarged like all iPhones have this now you can choose to enlarge text or, or even Android um th that's a that's a simple thing um with augmented reality games on touch screen in general we have a challenge for for people with mobility disabilities because clicking on the screen and and like making sure to shoot on this small area is a challenge it's actually a challenge for everyone who has like fingers that are slightly big uh, so let alone someone who maybe has issues in pointing at a specific area um and so one also thing that was seen in the survey and i'm sorry if i keep back into uh, going back into it with augmented reality games especially wheelchair users um or someone who's using a cane but they're not fully blind and so people when they notice these uh, players going around on a wheelchair or with the cane they don't understand what is happening and so they approach the players and ask them if they need help can i do something and sometimes even like touch them and, and pull them away thinking that they are helping um but of course they are not like they are intruding on the privacy of people who are just they're they're playing pokemon go and and so this is an issue with augmented reality is not necessarily about games it's about societal awareness um but it just i thought to mention it uh now as as part of you know the challenges with <laughs> ar games but for example like recently apple released this magic keyboard for the ipad and it has a trackpad that comes with it and it kind of changed the way you can interact with the touch screen because it, you might Google, like see a video of how it works, but you get like a small um, thingy, like a mouse option, like a, like a cursor on the screen. And now you can interact with the touch screen of the iPad using this magic um, keyboard and magic touchpad, which is a new way that we can facilitate access to touch screens but we haven't yet, for example, examined how can we use this with games or with phones. Um, and so we need just imp like importing these ideas from different places to games and examining them and, and, and seeing how they can work um, is something that also we need to work on. Um, Duolingo is, is, I'm mentioning it here because it, it's, a, it's nice for people with cognitive disabilities, especially because it breaks down um, lessons into smaller bites and so if you are a person with a learning difficulty it helps in making the task look smaller it helps with how much it repeats information um, it also has multimodality in communication because by by nature when you are learning a language you want to see it written and also hear how it is said so by default it has this done so it's like a, i mentioned it as a good example of a gamified app that has a good level of accessibility um, Duolingo has the problem of the fonts in it being small, so it's not perfect, but it has some good things. <laughs> the scary language. Um, I hope it's not really scary. <laughs> um, but Tanya, maybe we can, I would want to hear more <laughs> in the break. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Animal Crossing is an interesting case because uh, the Nintendo Switch, the, the Joy-Cons, for some people with motor disabilities, they are brilliant um, because you can somehow play with one hand or then like use one Joy-Con in, in, in one hand and then leave it and then pick up the other Joy-Con with the same hand. So if you have better mobility with one hand than the other, it, um, it helps kind of. And so the Nintendo Switch has good features in it, um, but it, the, the the score of, access, of of accessibility for Animal Crossing generally is 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 low because there are things in the game in the game that you can all only you do using audio. There is a certain bug, I think it was a, a cricket, a mole cricket. That o the only way to find it is to listen for where it is and and find um and and fi and, and find where the sound is coming from and then catch the cricket there, and and so there is. That is, if, you, if, a, if a person has a, has a hearing disability, it's sort of a no-go for them. They cannot catch this 
uh, mole cricket at, at all. And it's in, in blogs and so on, it's mentioned as something very annoying. One thing they did write was with fishing. And this is a short video I will play you now. Um, so in the game, you can catch different kinds of fish. And so there is this shadow of the fish in the water. And in order to catch it, there are two ways to do it. Either you're going to keep looking at the screen and notice when the shadow bites into this yellow thingy in, in the hook, bites to the hook, and then you, you catch the fish. Or if you cannot see the, ye the yellow hook, you can listen to when the fish bites, because when the fish bites, it, it makes a special audio. So I'm, I'm, that's an example of good design of like multimodality communication. I'm going to play you the video. It's, it's like five seconds. Let's see if it plays. Yeah. When the yellow thing sinks down, that's when you need to press A to catch the fish. It's very, very important you learn that. You're going to have to do it a few times to kind of get used to it, because every time you see the fish poke it, you're going to want to press A thinking it's it's caught. But listen to the sounds here quick. Poke. Poke. Catch. See? That little sinking sound like the poke is when you need to catch it. I'm going to actually show you. OK, so I hope you. Sorry. Ow. Sorry, my mic. Um... Yeah, I hope you you managed to catch what I what I uh, get. But like simple modifications to this to existing mainstream games um, can mean a lot of difference to people because then they can play this game like anyone else. Uh, I think this is one of the last examples. Board games can also be made accessible. One of the ways is that the pieces can have an NFC tag, and then um, players with disabilities can use their phone, read the NFC tag, and know what card this is or what is on the uh, playing uh, board. Um, and so that is one way that they can keep track of what is going on. Another way is printing, with, especially with 3D printers. This is an overlay on top of Monopoly for Braille users. And then they can just feel what is going on on the board because of this thingy on top of it. So in theory, this can be done in all board games. Thus far, these things are not sold mainstream. Like you cannot, maybe you can, but like I don't think you can find them online easily. Um, what I've seen is people printing them at home, um, like capable people who have access to 3D printers uh, doing this for their friends or for themselves. Um, there is also, now I remember, this was sold in IKEA a few years ago. Uh, what is it called? Domino. And this is how huge the piece is compared to a regular pen. So it's 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 really huge. It's made. It was sold in IKEA for everyone. Like it's a, like just like a toy for everyone because it's funny when it's that big. Um, but then seriously, for people with disabilities, this is a huge thing because then they can easily, if they have a vision impairment, easily see what is on um, the, the 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 playing board. Uh, there is this. Um, I think this is the setup behind me actually. So there's this CCTV thing, like placing a camera on top of the playing field and then connecting that camera to a screen. And then if someone has a, 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 doesn't see well or has even a color bl blindness, then they can have the monitor in front of them and change the colors on the monitor or zoom in and zoom out. And then so they can play anything that is desktop, a tabletop um, with everyone else. Uh, this is still, in a research phase, it hasn't become mainstream yet, but is you know one of the ways that we can explore uh, making games accessible. And so, in conclusion, fast guidelines: what makes sense, like have good contrast, like yellow phones on on a green background is annoying. Don't communicate things in, in just colors. Um, alt text, alt text to describe video uh, photos and also videos. Um, small texts are not good, voice over if you can, like just common sense stuff, I would say. Uh, and, and they are easy to, to implement most of them and make a huge difference. So there is this website called Game Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and here you will see that it is organized by disability. So sorry, by, by, by importance of the guideline. So basic, intermediate, advanced. Basic are the things that if you are developing a game, please make sure that you have these. These are basic. If you have more time, then go more towards the intermediate and advanced. And inside these tabs, they are divided by disability. Yes, this is where it is. Um, 
So basic guidelines for motor, cognitive, and vision. Important to note here that these guidelines are kind of outdated, but they are good enough, <laughs> I would say. Um, for example, like I said, we don't have guidelines for, for VR really um, almost at all. We, we, we have stuff, but it's like based on regular uh, um, 2D games and we need much more to be done for, for VR accessibility. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say, but I forgot it. So um, if I if I remember, <laughs> oh yeah, we have something a bit for AR for touch screens um, because it's an issue outside of games, like because every phone now and tablet is touch screen. So we do have something for those, but not game specific. But but they would work because like they they transfer. And so if you would allow me, I've been talking for an hour, but like maybe two or three more minutes. Um, because there are two myths that are kind of popular with, with accessibility. The first one is accessibility is hard work. So it is seen as a bottleneck for developers. Like they have finished their, their beautiful masterpiece. They want to release it. And now they you're just annoying us by making us implement this accessibility stuff. And we don't have time. We just want to release the game and they don't even have money. And so it is seen as extra work. And that is, yes, true and not true at the, at the same time. It's true that the way we have um, game development practices now place accessibility at the final stage of game development. And so it, it, it functions as a bottleneck. You have done all of this work and like the last thing is it is a bottleneck. But if you think about it, like if we educate designers from the start to look at the font of their game and ask like, is this font large enough? Can it be implemented in a way um, that allows people to control the font size, for example, um, or to notice that they are communicating everything in audio only and not in text? If developers are educated in that way, then accessibility becomes something that they implement automatically as they design their game. And so once they reach the final stage when they are about to release, it would have already been made accessible, sort of without extra effort in a way. And so we need like a reimagining or a redesign of a development process so that accessibility is implemented right away. And we also want like enlarging text in, in phones, giving people the ability to remap um, controls. They are not hard to implement. So also it's not really a bottleneck at the, at the, at the end. It is, we're asking for very simple features. Um, there are harder features and, and it would be hard to implement and everything, but at least the simple ones can be imp implemented and they would make, make a huge difference, uh, difference for everyone. So is it hard work? Yeah, but, but no, no, like it can be made easier. And if you just implement the easy stuff, th that's, you've gone mo most of the way. The last thing and this is usually something we hear mostly from people without disabilities, like from regular gamers. Um, and they see accessibility as cheating. Like you are playing on the easy mode. We are removing barriers from you. You are making the lowering the game from difficult to easy. Like this is a huge argument in itself. Um, and part of it is that, well, maybe games are not supposed to be made accessible because part of, of the game is the challenge. It's, it's about meeting challenges. Um, and so there is the idea that accessibility removes the challenge, which is kind of true, but it removes the challenges that should not be there. Like the challenge should not be in whether you're able to open the door or not. It should be the challenge of what happens after you open the door. And, and so, um, yeah, not all games, um, can be made accessible, maybe like, for example, first person shooter games like PUBG. It is about the, the visual challenge of noticing that there is someone hiding in a bush there and shooting them or hiding from them or whatever. Um, so making PUBG visually accessible is a huge challenge. And whether it will become accessible one day or not, that that's, is a huge question. We don't know. But in my humble opinion, if we decide right now that some games are not for everyone. If we make them accessible, we remove the challenge, the challenge and ruin them. 
if we make that conscious decision, then we stop trying to find a solution. And who knows what will happen if we try to find a solution. Like, for example, if you think about books, people who were blind and couldn't see were told that you will never be able to read um, because it's just impossible. Like you, you can't see and, and the text is, it has to be printed. And then now many years later, we have audio books. We figured a solution. So who knows, there could be a solution for, for PUBG and there are people exploring like haptic feedback um, and um, like sonar mapping and, and other tools that can be used to communicate the environment to someone who can see. Um, so it's um, like, it's a huge discussion, but I just, I wanna say that they are not mutually conclusive. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, let's make disability nature's gift. That That is, um, thank you so much. That's so beautiful. That is uh, my hope in, in many ways. And so finally, if you want to read more about accessibility in games, this is a database that I'm um, now developing of research published between 2016 and 2020. Um, so I was doing a literature review and then um, to publish it as, as a paper and so on. But then I thought, let's put it in a database so that also it's accessible for anyone who wants like resources on um, visual impair impairment or hearing impairment or so on. Um, so if you go to the address accessible-games.com, this is the, the, the interface. It's still beta because I'm, <laughs> it's only me working on this. So there are many things under development. If you look on, if you click on the database, you will get this thingy. Um, these are all the papers and they are categorized according to different things. So like type of disability, is it games, gamification, serious games? Is it about entertainment or education? It's overwhelming really. I am working on making this simpler, uh, but if you're looking for papers, I would say this is, could be one resource that can hopefully uh, be helpful to you. And if you want to be a part of this, if you want to generally research game, game accessibility or, or work on this database, like, please reach out to me. Um, we are three people working at Tampere University, maybe four, and like, we are happy to grow this as a, as a team that is generally working on game accessibility. So yeah, sh shoot me an email or um, anything. So um, this is for me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and sorry if I've talked for so long, I think I got too in enthusiastic. <laughs> and uh, questions, Jeffrey, I think. <laughs> yeah, that, that, no issues about the talk time. In fact, it was kind of really wonderful. All of us, even at the, well, the Degra core members were just in awe, basically, of this kind of discussion. Because I guess a lot of us speak from a position of privilege when it comes to these kind of things. So we do not necessarily notice. Uh, these uh the kind of issues so it's it's kind of really uh, well interesting to kind of take a step back and see another perspective in that way so thank you very much for that talk thank and you thank so you for making us aware about these kind of uh, well nuances as such uh so well we'll be taking uh, some questions uh the audience uh, please feel free to ask questions you can raise your hand and uh, then uh, you can ask the question or if you want you can type it in the chat We have a question from Anubhav. You can unmute yourself, Anubhav. Hello, interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, as you said, uh, a blind legend is like, uh, it uh, separates them from society games like that. Uh, it's like Paralympics. And when a person who is having disability, they beat a person who is uh, like non-disabled and they feel a, a sense of accomplishment, like uh, they can do it. So what are your take, what is your take on esports and how to make uh, dis disabled people participate in esports? Yeah, that's a <laughs> difficult question. I, I know that there are, there are gamers with disability in, in esports, but they have never been part of the like real leagues um, because there, there is the issue of that accessibility is cheating. So. I, I kind of like what you mentioned now, Paralympics, that could we have different esports track for, for people with disabilities? I think that, the, like, I don't know, now you gave me the idea and, and I kind of like it. 
because maybe it would bring awareness to that different people with any disability or any ability are playing games. So that would be nice to have. Making people with disabilities part of mainstream esports is challenging because they need the accommodations. And even within education, like regular school, whenever we offer accommodation to someone, it, it's seen as cheating. And I, and I don't think that will be solved soon. And maybe it is like, I, I don't know. I, I, don't wanna, I don't know if it is or isn't, but I don't think they will become part of the mainstream soon. So, so maybe something like para, Paralympic esports, para esports. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. I have a small interjection once Slobna is done. Uh, do we give it to Ishan? Uh, yeah, Ishan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah, sure. you. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You so are... just just because you brought it up, this is just an interesting little bit. Yeah. Uh, the Valorant actually has these colorblind modes, which it accounts for different kinds of colorblindness by changing the outline on enemy players, essentially. And one mm -hmm. of the top Valorant pros actually switched over from CS and he's colorblind. And he was talking about how it helped, how this accessibility feature in the game has actually given him something that he never had a chance of before. I think he has red green colorblindness, which is accounted for here. However, at the same time, Valorant has its own share of problems with zero subtitles and yeah. a host of other problems. But I also wanted to just uh, dovetail about what you were saying on the part of what the part where you're talking about different kinds of games for different kinds of people. So uh, yes, Tanya, that is what they're for. So when you were talking about something like a first person shooter, uh, say a multiplayer first person shooter, just for my interest in your mind, what are the mm -hmm. kinds of things that we could do in such a game to ensure that it is actually accessible to everybody instead of just lifting our hands up and saying, well, everything's not for everyone. You know, I I was thinking player highlight mechanics in like in La, in the Last of Us. If you've played it, they have I this have, uh, actually. Yeah, when when the 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 hearing mode or like the super hearing mode, something like that, and then everything goes black and white, and then they highlight the enemies with white, like with a white um, outline. Like I think something like that, but but that like. Okay, like, oh, oh, all right. Like, I think, okay, it could be cheating, fine. But then what if I, like, I am okay to cheat. Like, for example, in my one my workplace, some people like to play PUBG and I just want to play with them and they just want to play with me. We don't care about, we're not esports player, you know? Um, so maybe in this situation, it's okay, whether it is cheating or not, like who cares? But as long as we as a social group are okay with it. So I, I think like for me, that would make a huge difference. Uh, or, or like a sound notification that tells you there is an enemy close by. Maybe it doesn't necessarily highlight where the enemy is, but it tells you someone is close. So then you become aware and you try to look more closely. But yeah. Thank you. These are my, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I have a question too, uh, like since you're talking about these uh, concepts like, well, highlighting enemies and all, like mm -hmm. I'm not really sure how long it's been happening, but uh, what I noticed like uh, one of the games that I play, played most recently was like Far Cry 6, where this these options were there, but for the first time I would feel like these options are presented in a menu very clearly, rather than it being like yeah. you just flip an option and then these options are shown. So do you feel that, uh, well, uh, and given that Far Cry is by Ubisoft, which is quite a huge company when it comes to games, do you feel that uh, they are taking this approach to now, well, highlight uh, the topics of uh, disability like and accessibility uh, in uh, modern, uh, well, AAA games, for example? Do you think that it's, uh, it's like they are becoming more aware of this compared to like, say, maybe even like two, three years ago? Uh, yeah, yeah, d definitely. I think um, there is a person called Ian Hamilton. I'm going to type his name uh, in the chat if you want to look him up. But, and Ian Hamilton has been following disability and accessibility specifically. Hamilton, yeah. 
uh, like since early 2005 or something. And uh, he has a timeline of how many games were there and how, how it has changed. And you can see in this timeline that now there are more games being made accessible and more guidelines being released by Microsoft and um, Xbox adaptive controller and all of that. And I, I think this, this is a, a result of activism. Like there were different activism groups for years working on this. And it's once you have a, a big triple E studio implemented the other ones have to compete in the same way. Like they have to follow suit to 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 continue in the competition. And so I think that this is how it started. Like maybe The Last of Us was the first like big hit, and then it started from there. Or I'm not sure what what was the first big hit, but I I think this is how it it snowballed, and and you can see it in Ian's timeline. Um, and uh, there is also now that it's becoming sort of PR move that like like charity and like you know like like with clothes like now um saying sustainable clothes for example or ethical manufacturing it, it's becoming like the, like a way to brand themselves uh which i feel good and bad about <laughs> like it, it feels morally wrong in in a way like i'm not happy to see it but also i'm happy that at least something is happening um and so this pr is also like driving it so yeah, it, it's it's getting better, I think, which not bad. Thank you uh, for that answer. I think uh, Dr. Sovich Mukherjee wants to ask a question. So please go ahead. Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you for that fantastic talk, Lomna. Uh, thank you. It's a, a lot learned a lot from it. Uh, I had uh, I had a similar question like Avin uh, uh, earlier, but uh, I mean I I wanted to ask two questions actually. One is uh, about kind of how expensive uh, is kind of uh, kind of making these games accessible, uh, especially kind of when we're looking at kind of indie studios and kind of smaller mm -hmm. studios, and what kind of incentive could uh, could there be for uh, for for them to kind of do this? Uh, nevertheless, like you said, it's it's like part of an ethical standard and things like that. So. Uh, you know, uh, so so that uh, so that it's it's something that they 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 kind of also do by default. And the second question yeah. is something slightly different. Uh, or, or do you want to take this one first and then I ask the uh, next up one? to you? Okay. okay. So the second thing is uh, so um, I I worked in Nottingham Trent University a while ago, and uh, I was working with kind of uh, video games, uh, making video games as well a little bit, and. We had a uh, we had uh, we were using the Wii mote to uh, to create something like a walking stick for the visually challenged, and uh, uh, so my my kind of uh, I mean I'm coming in from a different trajectory. Where I mean, do you know of any kind of uh, video game technologies that are actually kind of contributing to making things more accessible, even outside games? I mean, we've been talking about kind of technologies playing games uh, and accessibility, but what about video game technologies actually uh, kind of taking this, uh, take, taking their affordances outside just playing games? Is there any any research on this? Because uh, I know that the Wiimote project has just kind of died a death. It's, it's just stopped yeah. altogether. Okay. First question about how expensive uh, is it? It, well, the argument thus far has been that it is expensive. I, I don't know how it is quantified, but it is um, in the sense of that most people think, which could be true, that they need an accessibility specialist or expert um, that tells them what to do. Like, uh, how do we make this accessible to people with uh, a hearing disability, for example? Um, and, and so hiring someone like that is, is an expense. And then finding like people with disabilities as testers is also another expense because the part of uh, Q&A. And, and so these have been cited as the like biggest expenses that are there. Um, I think that these should not be an issue nowadays if we have the guidelines and they are published. I think like any developer 
can go and, and, and read through these outlines and implement them, it might cost them development hours as, as, um, as a cost, like that they might spend, um, spend one more month developing the game, for example, rather than immediately releasing. So it would lengthen the development process, process in that way, at least if not then cost that you hire a special accessibility person. Uh, and, and so I think that if we, for from the start, educate developers, like I said, so they, are, they know to immediately design accessibly from the get-go, then maybe this helps. Um, but are we at this stage or not? I, I don't know. We're actually doing another survey with people, with developers, um, but it's now in ethical approval yet. I was hoping I might have some findings uh, this talk, but not, not yet. Uh, and in this, we want to talk to, if we find indie and triple E people, developers working in those companies, then both, and then compare how, how they are different, uh, accessibility practices are different depending on the size of the company. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll find out, but thus far the expenses are, are, like I said, like more cost because people need to work more or hire special people. Um, and there is also like, I was interested on do accessibility game or accessible games come from indie developers more or triple E more. And the quick answer I found is that nowadays it's more from triple E companies. Um, there were like a few indie developers, but they would be making games for like themselves and, or, or their cousin who has some disability. And so they never picked up as popular titles, but they were there, these small releases and um, in, in, gamer, in gaming community, people with disabilities knew, knew about them and would recommend them to each other, but it wasn't really like a huge, like none of them became like successful or I, at least I'm not aware of one. Um, so it seems to be mostly triple A that are making the money or investment because like a PR move, I, I guess. And then the second question, not 100% that I understand it, but uh, the Wii controller especially has been used in, in, in allowing people with disabilities experiences they cannot play otherwise, like go golf, for example, playing golf or um, tennis, you know, you know, all of that. And it was a huge hit when they discontinued it. And then now um, when someone finds a Wii like controller, they, it's, it can, they hoard it in a way like they, um, and yeah. Uh, with VR, there is now hope that you can experience other things more real, like for example, diving. If you can't dive in real life for any reason, you can dive with VR. Um, but then VR has its own issues in terms of uh, motion sickness and cyber sickness and all that. So that is still, I haven't seen it. Um, there, there is also rehabilitation, maybe. The, if that answers your question, like um, that part to relieve the, the pain, um, if, if I'm trying to rehabilitate someone to, to use their hand or something, so they would press on, 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 on a thingy that is part of a game. And like when they press harder, they collect more points or their character moves more forward, something like that. So using it as part of rehabilitation. That is very, very popular and very, there's a lot of research showing that it's very effective in, in pain relief. Like it medically, maybe the outcomes are the same as regular rehabilitation, but people feel better and, and enjoy it more because they are playing a game now, not just doing the, their uh, physical therapy. Uh, is that what you're <laughs> looking for, Subic? Yes, uh, precisely. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, I mean that's that's a really I mean I was looking for looking for something like rehabilitation and uh, kind of uh, thanks. So I had like one more thing to say, which is that uh, kind of uh, you know, I, from what you said, I, I was thinking that it might be an idea to uh, uh, to kind of uh, well uh, sort of include this in pedagogy, uh, especially as kind of we are involved with kind of organizing games courses. So maybe compulsory sections of games courses, and also uh, maybe like a panel in every games conference like Digra and others on accessibility, yeah. Uh, yeah. which uh, is by default really, rather than 
Yeah, that would yeah. be beautiful. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, I, I try. I, I'm running a course at Tampere University, and I think if if every course on games can have one lecture or like half a lecture or something about this, it would be beautiful. Yeah, please and panels. Yes. <laughs> okay, I see Anubhav in in chat was saying crowdfunding. Um, so crowdfunding is a great idea. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if what I'm gonna say is accurate, but to very uh, and until very recently, most people with disabilities suffered from high levels of unemployment, and if they are employed, they would be paid less because discrimination, <laughs> and um, so they don't have a lot of spending power to spend on games. I think this is changing because the a lot of people with disabilities are getting educated and even. Like the UN is showing that, that, that the percentage is increasing, but it's still not a lot. Um, I don't know what percent are educated and what at what level, but it, I remember there was low. Um, and so they might not have the funding themselves to, to pay on, on games. Um, so, so maybe like generally society could crowdfund. I... I don't know if there was a like that. That's interesting to look into. Has someone tried crowdfunding, and what was the outcome? P please research that. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but it must be there. Like it should be. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions from anyone? Well, if not, then I guess we can conclude the session. And thank you so much, Dr. Hassan, for that. And uh, I hope we get to see more of your research later on. And uh, please do share uh, your links with us that you presented in the presentation. We will be sure to add them along with our uh, uh, in the description of our videos on YouTube. Right. OK, uh, sounds great. Okay, so with that, uh, I guess we can end the session. I'll stop the recording. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a good day.